Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with Rob and John. Hey, guys. Hey. Hello. And this week, it is my turn, and I chose a story by Roxanne Gay. It's from her collection called, I had to look up how to say this so I didn't sound like a jerk, IAT, which means Land of High Mountains. The whole collection is apparently centered around Haiti, which is where her parents are from. Um, she actually grew up in Nebraska, but she writes a lot about their heritage, her heritage, and I'm assuming she's visited enough to be able to write about it like this. So this is a short story that they shared called Sweet on the Tongue. And I'm actually going to read the end because I feel like that's it's a good taste of everything, but it also kind of like summarizes the point here. Campbell flies out to meet me. I wait on the sidewalk as a town car pulls up. Campbell Jr., CJ, bounds out of the car first, his arms thrust high in the air. I still don't see the men who force their way into me when I look at my son. I hope I never will. CJ jumps into my arms and I clasp the back of his head. The curved bone fits perfectly in my palm. I can breathe again. I cover his face in kisses and he giggles. He says, mommy, mommy, mommy. Campbell tips the driver. I grab his shirt and pull him in. When he kisses me, I am home. I never thought this day would come, Campbell says. I slide my hand into the pocket of his jeans, pulling him closer still. I am ready. Maria is startled when we walk into my aunt's house. You have a son, she says, stuttering. Campbell is holding him now, our son drowsy from the long flight, his arms hanging limply at his sides. I told you I did. She she clears her throat. I don't know what she wants from me, who she wants me to be. She studies Campbell. In my mother tongue, she says, you married an old man. I want to claw her eyes out. I hold Campbell's arm possessively. Finally, she says, I must attend to your grandmother. As she walks away, Campbell elbows me. I'm not that old. She has a big ass. That evening, I sit with my grandmother, holding CJ in my lap, surrounded by the smell and joy of him. Such a beautiful boy, she says. Her eyes are milky. I hold her hand, can feel the fragility of that network of bones. I wanted you to know him. CJ claps his hands and sings a song I don't recognize. He loves to sing. Sometimes Campbell and I hear him on the baby monitor, singing in his room. We laugh and laugh and laugh. Do you want to give your great-grandmother a kiss? I whisper into CJ's ear. He nods politely and leans in, leaving a loud wet kiss on her cheek. He squirms out of my arms and runs away. Campbell, I say loudly, he's on his way to you. I hold my breath until I hear Campbell growl and CJ growls back. It's this thing they do that I don't pretend to understand. I can still feel my son in the room. Some part of him is always with me. My grandmother leans into me, says my aunt is stealing her money. I listen carefully. I take her seriously. She's not allowed to have money. She'll use it to bribe Maria to bring her cakes and other confections. She's always had a sweet tooth and Maria is corruptible. My grandmother's tongue, like my son's, is awfully fond of sugar. Cool. After that last word, I wrote, yikes. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> so I picked Roxane Gay because I think I was like on Twitter or something and she popped up. And I was like, oh yeah, we should probably do her. And I wanted to originally find a story that she wrote when she lived in Naples, Florida. Get out of here. She lived here wow. for a couple years. And I remember I found out, and it was before I had read any of her stuff, really. So I was like, oh, cool. And then I read her book and I remembered that she lived here. And I looked her up and she had long since gone or else I would have been like, listen. <laughs> we have this terrible writer's workshop that's extremely beneath you. I'd love for you to come and talk to us at least. But the story that she wrote is worth reading. It was not long enough to read for this podcast. It was like three or four paragraphs. But she wrote a story not about herself, but kind of about a woman who's clearly not white. I think she is obviously black in the in the uh, story or she's from Haiti, which is like a theme with a lot of her stuff. But um, she moves to Naples with her husband because her husband gets a job and they move to a gated community and she starts taking exercise classes during the day at the community gym because she's got nothing going on really and um all the women are like marveling at her the whole time and she just writes about what it's like to exist as a black woman but also <laughs> in naples florida and after i read that story i was like oh man i should have emailed her while she lived here not that i'm black but that'd be a really perfect we could have hung out it was a great story perfect story right here oh my god it was i was like man you only have to live in naples for 20 minutes to, <laughs> <laughs> to know what it's like so I read a couple of her stories and I wanted to find one that I thought was kind of all encompassing. And I thought this one, I really ended up enjoying it because it was longer than a lot of her other essays. Um, this is one that she, she wrote like an entire book called Hunger, which is all like first person essays. So this was unique for me in terms of reading Roxane Gay. And I was like, oh, this is like a longer story where she like really gets into the meat of it. This one, when I printed it out, was like 25 pages. So it's like a solid story. I feel like the other ones are kind of like essays or short stories. And 
And so you get to see like a lot of things build and layer on each other. And there's a good sense of like time passing and there's different settings and countries. And by the end, I feel like you get this kind of full picture versus like a taste, which I wish she would have write, written an entire book about Naples, you know? <laughs> like, okay. So so I felt like this was good. Um, I don't know. Do you, have you guys read much of her stuff or? No, I've heard of her, but I haven't read her stuff yet. Does she, did she run Pank? Is that her? Oh, she might have. She also has like a new magazine called gay and like her last name and yeah. um she does a lot of like weird stuff she she's she's written a lot of erotica which is like i read i read this one story trying to find a story for this and it, i didn't realize it was erotica <laughs> until it was like really erotica yeah Oops. and by then i was like way too into it so i like i read the whole thing and i was like ah, i don't really want my dad to hear this one <laughs> but but her erotica to her credit did not read like erotica it was not smut it was yeah. like it had an arc and i almost wanted to read it but i didn't i didn't want to touch it i didn't feel like i had the i don't I don't know the skill level to comment not that i do for this either but anyway i thought this was like a, a really good example of what she can do in with what's like kind of purely fiction and what i would consider a, like a, a pretty typical short story there's a lot of dialogue and what i kind of realized when i was thinking about the story today before we recorded was that for this main character i think her parents are of haitian descent in this book or in this essay and she goes on to become a doctor and she meets her husband when he keeps coming into the er and kind of like asking her out over and over and over and she finally says yes and we meet the characters in the present when she goes to visit her grandmother and the grandmother's being taken care of by a woman who's also from Haiti and she basically hits on her and tries to make out with her and she's like I thought you would have liked this given that you were raped and then you go into this whole backstory about how this character the doctor was raped on her honeymoon in Haiti and not just like you know a standard rape or something she was kidnapped for like four days and held ransom and given back to her husband husband and she gets pregnant and decides to keep the kid at the very last minute after giving birth and so when she brings her son to her dying grandmother's bed at the end here it's it's symbolic because she's kind of sheltered him from the family she she loves him but she knows there's something different about how he was conceived he's obviously not Campbell's son and then the nurse is like holy shit I thought you were kind of like pushing me off but what I realized was Campbell pushed himself on her she didn't say yes to him at first that's a great point and then this guy rapes her she obviously didn't say yes to him and then this woman tries to make out with her and she's like no 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 so I think by the end for me at least it was hard for me to know aside from this little boy like who she wanted yeah she's like she's not a weak character but she's so quiet like everyone accuses her of that you get very little you know right she's yeah she's chilly or just like tra- you know damaged something yeah it's almost like she she kind of like lets certain things happen to her when she's describing you're, you're in like her point of view when the nurse is coming on to her and she's confused but she doesn't like shove her away when she's kissing her she has this like kind of bizarre reaction where if you're the nurse maybe you're thinking oh she definitely wants it she just doesn't know how to say yes this is her first you know lesbian encounter or something and with Campbell it's like the standard romantic comedy right it's always funny when the guy chases the girl yeah and for, for him to actually work in Hollywood was like a, a fun it seemed like a, like, yeah. a, like a basic joke in a fun way right this actually reminded me of uh, the movie Ever After mm-hmm. yeah weird it's way it, but no it's like 20 something years ago but my issue with that movie was always i understand why the prince likes her but i don't understand why she likes him and i had the same feeling yeah at the beginning of this with campbell but it's not like ever after because by the end i know why she likes him because he's revealed more after after they get together after they get together in the flow of the narrative you start to see him and and how good he can be but that's not really portrayed in their um initial yeah in their uh, courtship yeah right he, he's like kind of br- he brings around like his movie friend and the movie friend's like you know I'm only here to impress you and she's like no <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm not impressed <laughs> and he literally visits the hospital like three times yeah but you're right by the time we learn about the rape and then like just kind of see how they're interacting in real life you can see that there's a real affection for him like whether or not it was something she and not only that wanted he, in the beginning he acts in a way that I recognize why she would have affection for him, why she he's a good guy yeah he's a great guy in the, totally different than the kind of way he was portrayed in the beginning yeah he like, came off as just kind of like cocky and she was yeah. too there there is a an exchange that i read today and i i didn't catch it the first time but i realized like how like what deft writing it was and she said something like i work 90 hours a week and he's like what do you do with the other 78 and i didn't do the actual math and i don't even know if i said it correctly net just now but i'm sure when she was writing it she did and like for him to have done the math on the spot is supposed to be like like he, i'm your banter equal if nothing mm. else right yeah. like you're getting off on this exchange and 
I thought that was interesting. So Yeah, but, you were right. 90 and 78. Okay, cool. Yeah. What does that add up to? Who knows? <laughs> Roxanne Gay, though, also, she's like openly bisexual. So there's all, there's always like, I feel like everything I've read from her is when it's fiction like this. There has There's like that kind of undertone. And then there's usually like specific mention of Haiti, specifically being like from an island versus like other countries. And I don't know, I just felt like this was like also a good example of everything that she likes to touch on. And then the main character, I don't know if it's supposed to be her, but it feels as real to her as like some of her essays. Like well, she's, yeah. yeah, she's she's known for being just like sharp and kind of like an imposing presence, right? Like on Twitter, I think her Twitter says something like you clap, I clap back. And she gets into it with people and you can tell like she's almost baiting them j- but just by existing sometimes. She writes about that in Hunger, like a woman that's black and overweight and bisexual and like people just can't handle that. Can't resist, yeah. Yeah. So did you guys like the story itself? Yeah, I like the uh, male female stuff a lot. How just the differences where he doesn't shut up and then or hit, like the courtship differences were funny. Yeah, it seemed like yeah, the rom com is a great description of it. It fed that kind of bouncy feeling at first. And then for it to take that the route that it does was you kinda of figure something big's this is a long story. So you know something yeah. big's gonna happen. You're just kinda of curious. Yeah. Yeah, pretty horrific. It, it was almost like a bait and switch for me because I I kinda of felt like Campbell was coming on so hard and then she finally gave in. I felt like maybe he was going to be the bad guy somehow, right? Like her instincts were going to have paid off by the end. Or he was gonna, at least going to let her down. Yeah, something. And then it's like so telling when she comes back from her grandma's and she's like, oh, the nurse made out with me. And he's like, how was it? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> he literally says like, did you kiss her with tongue? That felt like a very true to life exchange. Right there. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I really loved that he was from Hollywood. I thought that was like perfect. That was like a perfect F you to like <laughs> that type of uh, I want to impress you type stuff. Right. I thought the uh, the the Maria scenes were my favorite. I thought that I mean they're the most tense. Probably. Yeah, they are. And they were drawn out, and you kept coming back to it, and it felt like a movie that kept cutting and coming back. And right. That was a fun structure. I didn't even realize that. Like I said, I originally read this like a week or so ago, and so when I skimmed it again today, I was like, oh my gosh, I imagine the Maria scene in its entirety when I think of it. I don't think oh, about yeah. having gotten it piecemeal. So yeah, when she like kind of weaves it like that, it's it's interesting. And then and then yeah, like I I think I had it right where the bit where Maria says like I thought you would have liked it that's I think when she's like all right narrator reader yeah that was kind of her turn yeah like now is when I have to explain to you what happened to me and so like the whole sugar bit is I'm pretty sure she's like raped in a or she's like taken to a sugarcane field when they kidnap her Mm -hmm. yeah warehouse or yeah some processing or warehouse or warehouse okay sorry um so she's taken to a sugarcane warehouse and doesn't it go down like on a big pile of sugar or something i don't remember yeah it's a scary scene she's on top of it and it's cutting her it's pretty awful i thought it was an interesting kind of like the the summary at the end there where she's like oh my grandma loves sugar and my son loves sugar well everyone loves sugar right it's modified in a way that our brains can't resist and it's in all foods but for her this ever-present ingredient just reminds her of her rape every day can you imagine that like her son obviously does too well she said something like at the end there that i read like you know no part of him looks like the guy or like reminds her of the guys in particular yeah, that was a great dramatic. You don't really see that moment dramatized. I mean, you know how there's only so many different types of stories and plots. Like you, you don't really see like the birth of the rape kid, bastard, whatever right. you want to call him. Which was uh, yeah, that was pretty. That was affecting. That was a good scene. Yeah, I like too how they she focuses in on the scene in the hospital where she gives birth and she's yeah, like, like deciding right then. Guy would not write that scene. Yeah. Right. What did you think, John? I liked it. I felt like she was portrayed as being really confident in the beginning, and that confidence kind of slipped away after she was kidnapped. And, um, and I, I really liked the way that that was portrayed, and where she kind of lost that confidence and became like the way you guys described her, smaller and quieter. You know, she's always sharp with the comebacks in the beginning, or not the beginning of the story, but the beginning of the uh, the timeline, I guess, because it's, like you said, it jumps back and forth. So in all those scenes during the courtship and stuff, she's like, the banter is quick and she kind of grows back into it but i don't know there's a whole section in the middle of the timeline where she loses that i really like the way that she changed that way and you can see the shifts in her personality and character i think when you read a story like this is kind of like oh i wonder how she wrote it she did she write it beginning to end did she know when to cut away and like when to come back and like when to give a reveal and i think the answer is probably no she probably had an inkling but i doubt she like went in a straight line yeah i guess she knew about like the rape yeah yeah like that i would think that's like 
like a driver. Yeah. That's an interesting question because I can see one section where she just writes it linearly and then finds out how to restructure it. But the other way is to write it kind of a, you, th- you know, the beats of the story or the, 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 the timeline, the, the narrative, but then you start writing at the, what is temporarily the ending, you know, with the, the nurse and the grandmother. And then you have to bring in what led up to the moment that you're building towards. And I feel like there's a way to write that where you're feeling the emotional drawing up of the story so that you just get a sense like, okay, now I need to go back and pull yeah. that scene in. And then now that I've pulled that scene in, I can come back and then continue pulling forward with that. It's almost like... Um, I think it's possible to write it yeah. this oh, way. Yeah. I think if you're an expert writer, you could probably like yeah. feel it kind of swelling and changing and shifting. But, but if you're not, it's almost like she shifts every time there's a sort of climax in that plot. It's like you don't you don't like break away when I'm bored because then it's like a it's like a uh, reward almost. It's like oh you're done with this you eat your vegetables. But it's more like get to a good part where Maria just kissed her and then switch over here and make me read this other thing so I can get through it to the other part. Oh but wait I also enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, storytelling is such a scam sometimes like that. Oh yeah, it? it's like um someone described that to me once. I think it was like a publisher person that we had in. They were like yeah, it was a publisher guy we had come talk to us. He was like, you know, um, when they say like something's a fast read, he's like, they're short chapters and they all end on a cliffhanger. So it's fast because you think one more, one more, one more. It's like, oh my God. So you're telling me I can force my reader to think a certain way about my story just by formatting it a certain way. Yeah, you can. I mean, you can look at the way you read yourself. Like even this story, a lot of it is like, okay, there's only one break on yeah, this page yeah. and there's another break mm-hmm. like, really quick. Okay, I can just read that next section. The breaks really do help. The yeah. New Yorker does that a lot too and I appreciate it. Especially, I always guess, I, I guess I always assumed the New Yorker did it because it was uh, digital and these are getting published by them firsthand. You know what I mean? So I thought that the New Yorker was like helping me out when I have to scroll through this body of text. But then when I see it in places like this, Literary Hub, when I know that it's from a collection, I'm like, thank you, Roxanne. You know exactly where I need to like... Get a refill. Yeah, I mean, this was a fast read. And this was a long story. Yeah, when I pulled it up, I was like, I don't know. And then 30 minutes later, or... Yeah, this did not take <laughs> me long to read. Yeah. And I'm not like a fast, fast No, reader. I'm not. One of those talking about coming to a moment where you know you need information and so you dive back into a previous scene. There's a, I don't even know how to guide you to this because this is my different pagination, but okay. um, it's on our second date. Campbell told oh, yeah. me he had someone he wanted me to meet. It's like when they're meeting um, the actress. The friend. actress, yeah. And she says, as I sank into my chair, I recognized her as a movie star having a very good year, or at least that's what people told me. During lulls in the hospital, I often sat in the waiting room reading the magazines, abandoned there. It was the only way I knew anything about anything. She extended a long willowy arm. Those two sentences during lulls at the hospital, in the hospital, and um, it was the only way I knew anything about anything is totally out of place in the scene, right? It's not part of that scene. It's it's a flashback. It's a two sentence flashback creating a new scene, but it's kind of explaining to us how she recognizes this person because she reads People magazine and why she reads yeah, People yeah, magazine yeah. and all this kind of stuff. So like little, we I think that's just a two sentence thing, and we do that all the time just as we're writing. Yeah, it doesn't occur to you that it's something unique that you're kind yeah. of explaining in that moment yeah exactly you you don't think of it necessarily as jumping back and forth the way a narrative would through time but it, it happens we do that all the time like to kind of explain a current moment we reach back to the past and i think so that's just a small version of what this does writ large i was just like kind of looking over it just now and the section where you find out that she's pregnant is right after she's having like a she has a moment with melinda the actress who's like trying to comfort her she's like i don't even know what to say like she found out that she was raped on the honeymoon and then in the next section it says it starts out by saying I didn't make sense of it at first I couldn't keep food down and I think like oh, yeah. yeah if you're a really good writer and you're on top of it as a reader you don't need to read the rest to realize this like horror is she's pregnant and I don't know I feel like a less skilled writer might have I don't know there's just a subtlety to that yeah right like it can slide right past subtle you and dramatic and like think of things that are dramatic but not subtle I think that's what <laughs> yeah, that's like a, a, a lesser kind of writer might have done like I was pregnant, period. (laughs) Like, yeah, it slaps you, but it's not deftly done. I think those are the small moments for me where I'm like, okay, yeah, Roxane Gay is a unique voice. She's a competent writer, but you realize how how she's actually a great writer, you know, with these little sentences like that. I I feel like when someone's like a competent writer, it's like, oh, I read the whole thing and I understood it. And then there's stories like this where it's like, oh, it's going to stick with me, but not just because of the content, right? Mm -hmm. That's a good way to put it, yeah. 
Yeah, it flies along without you realizing it. And you, you yeah. Have, yeah, you have to build those cliffhangers every couple of sentences, it mm-hmm. seems like. Particularly because there's like there's a um what's happening in the beginning again? She, you're just yeah, this she takes a while to kind of establish everything. Yeah, she spends a lot of time on yeah. Campbell. Well, and the grandmother and Maria's up there first, but like you, you really don't know where it's going until the until she's like, All right, reader, I was raped. Yeah, I mean yeah, the the great you think it's gonna be a family story because you the first thing the first words are my grandmother. <laughs> yeah, my you're grandmother like, uh, yeah, eighty seven. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she's kind of lulling you, and then mm-hmm. yeah, she steps on the gas. You can tell um, the sexual tension is really subtle too. As far as when it starts, you're like, wait, what's going on <laughs> with these two? I know. Well, like I said, having read a lot of her stuff and knowing that she's like openly bisexual, and how hard Campbell came on, and yeah, how she was like, for it. Yeah. well, I was kind of like, oh, maybe, maybe she does, maybe she is interested. I could almost see how Maria, you know, Maria didn't try to rape her. I think Maria was just like, come on. Yeah, you know, I'm re- I'm picking up what you're putting down, and she's like, "No, you're not." It felt like an honest mistake almost. And that's kind of another scene that you don't usually see is that like the well, maybe you did, maybe not so much, but like the nurse and the family getting together. I, I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen that actually. No, you mostly see like the pool boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that kind of scene. Yeah, so the second page, at the end of the first section, it says, this is like where it gets like, it's weird even for the reader, to our credit. It says, on the first night, my grandmother falls asleep watching the evening news. News of war exhausts her. Maria and I smoke in the small backyard, leaning against a brick wall. My grandmother was not incorrect in her evaluation of Maria's ass. But Maria is attractive. Not much older than me, dark brown skin, white teeth, soft, sweet smelling skin. So like we're in, we're in the narrator's head and this is what she's noticing about this woman. Not like she, I mean, she's, she's describing her physically and she, she's noticing her ass. Like her grandma said, like, I know we all do that. We all look at people and we think about them physically, even if it's not like the first and only thing you think about. But as, as a writer in this moment, that's what she's like kind of choosing to, to describe the the story in. When a writer chooses to have the character yeah. think of something, it's important. Yeah. Right? So I don't know. I didn't take that as kind of like a passive thought. I thought like, this is telling us something and she says and then it goes on to say i ask her for her real name and she waves the hand limply just call me maria her accent is familiar the evening is cold a cold to which our island skin is not accustomed it hurts to breathe too deeply when maria exhales i inhale do you like this kind of work i ask maria shrugs ashes her cigarette i can no longer see the edges of her, the edges of her face she steps closer it leans in until i can feel her breast against mine do you like your kind of work <laughs> it's like whoa maria whoa what's going on yeah and she doesn't like i don't know no. The next paragraph is we fall into a routine over the next several days. When Maria's ready to smoke, she taps my shoulder, lets her fingers rest too long, and I follow her outside. So there's this weird dynamic going on that I think it's legitimate to be confused, especially since we haven't met Campbell yet at this point. Yeah, it's a great way to introduce everybody with this like little flirtation they're having. Yeah. That's cool. She's like getting it on with this nurse. She's visiting the grandma. And then I think the next section is going to be Campbell. Well, it, it's, there's not a break, but it says I don't visit my family often already I'm exhausted and then she's like basically I live in Los Angeles in a loft apartment with a man Campbell who works a great deal she doesn't and then she says later we are married and our marriage is complicated so I'm like what's going on here like yeah even the way she introduces the wedding it's like she refers to herself in the third person as the bride was wearing this or that and then the next paragraph drops into I like the the my bare feet in the sand or something like that Mm -hmm. oh my feet were bare much to my mother's chagrin yeah the bride wore white a long sleeveless dress my feet were bare, much to my mother's chagrin. It's like this is her own re- wedding, but she's describing yeah, she's it as she's describing someone else almost. Yeah. yeah, that reminds me that like I picked up on this like cold, distant damage thing like almost immediately. Like yeah. you know, it's, it's something about the sentences, or you just know that this person's out of it. Yeah, I was almost surprised to find out that the rape happened on their honeymoon and not like before she met Campbell. The way mm-hmm. it was, the way she even was with him. It's almost like maybe maybe this is it. It's almost like she definitely maybe is bi or gay or whatever. She gets with Campbell. She gets raped. And he takes care of her in a way that's like, he's the only person that was there in that moment, right? So yeah. they have this bond that can't be broken almost. I don't know. It's definitely complicated. Yeah, it's a good love story. So I guess what I would take away from this is we talked a lot about how she structures it. She jumps back and forth. And I think if you're a new writer, even if you did it with two different things, like two different moments in time or settings or whatever, two different narrative arcs. I've done it before where I've written both linear- linearly and then actually gone through and said, this would be a good break. Break. Maybe not exactly the way I have it written, but break it here. Put this section here. I've, I've literally storyboarded it like that. If 
not on paper than in my head, right? Before I've approached it this way. And and it always takes like a lot of massaging afterwards. But what you get, I think, is something close to this where you're excited by both stories and you're getting them in the right order. And it just kind of adds a layer. What do you guys think? What's your takeaway? <laughs> Rob's like, I didn't do the homework. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my takeaway it was, um, I saw her as a shifting character, like a changing character. Mm-hmm. You know, before the rape, after rape, it was different personalities. Right. Before and after her, her son was born, different personalities, different approaches to the way she thought about things. And I just really liked the way the narrative handled that, the way it was handled. So I think, um, you know, I'm not, we could dive into exactly how that's done, but this is a takeaway. It's just paying attention to how the story changes your character and just portraying those yeah. changes and making them you know just that subtlety of how how things change throughout the story and to that point like it doesn't have to be this is like one of the most dramatic things that can change a character right oh yeah but this character changed in other subtle ways that i think like happened you know before and after the rape like had nothing to do with that you know and yeah. you, can, you can accomplish that even if it's not something over and dramatic and like physical that happened yes yeah like before and after a limp is like a really cheesy way to do it yeah yeah like a, like a, okay you're you've been changed physically and like how do you yeah but some you know just it can be done like subtle um, kind of that's what we just listened to with rob's story where it was like the woman was picking the book up over and over and over oh yeah into exactly her deathbed right. so yeah. the only thing that changed for her was age we talked about how she had a different reading of the book every time she read it and age and the way other people read her book yeah and, yeah and it had profound effects on on her throughout the story that that was the point of that story yeah but i think to your point it's like it can be something as subtle as time passing that yeah. changes the character so keep that in mind when you're like what switching setting switching time yeah and it's not so much that it's a different character she always has the same kind of general properties but there's a and like the same affect she's still yeah, affect yeah kind of has a wall up almost yeah well rob do we give you enough time yeah it's gotta get enough time after that <laughs> <laughs> I don't read a lot of stories about relationships, so this was interesting to to see male and female and female female and how it, it just seemed like it was a story about that. Like there was, of course, the, the dramatic conflict toward the end there, but that's kind of what I'll remember about it is just kind of it seemed like putting a mirror up to both. Like that's, it just seemed like a compare and contrast sort of whether that's like a com not a comedy of errors but a comedy of manners I mean so yeah I liked I like seeing the the gender side of the gender sort of paired up and then compare like that it's fun it is kind of a love story right like she's in love with her son even mm-hmm. if she's not in love with Campbell or Maria <laughs> I think she's in love with Campbell I think she is but I wonder if it's like romantic yeah it's definitely not romantic it's more like really functional like she found a guy who's like oh you made out with a girl cool <laughs> I can live with this yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Oh, Roxanne, you should have hung out with me in Naples. Okay, bye. (laughs) That's fine.